Happy Sabbath, church. Before I talk, uh, I mean, before I play, I'm not going to be up here long. Jay had been asking me for a long time to get up here to do special music. And normally wouldn't be able to do it because I do this for a living, so I'm always out of town or somewhere across the country or whatnot. But I uh, just wanted to say that, uh, you know, Charlie always speak, and he always has good words of encouragement to say. And he's young, just like I am. So if you haven't got it by now, it's time to pass the torch to the younger people. Amen. That's the whole reason for continuing to build our church. You know, I had so much fun last week when Melanie and Nora, they put on the whole little after Sabbath activity. It was so fun. It reminded me of the old days and how we all used to interact as a family. Amen. And she is your sister, and you have to stand behind her when she does this thing. Yeah. And um, that's the only way you can grow. And the last thing I want to say is for the Pathfinders. I was there, and you know, these are our kids, our children, our young adults, young leaders is the, is the term. And um, the church should be filled up for that ceremony. How are you gonna give them encouragement to go do things for the Lord if you're not there, if you ain't standing behind them? So uh, I'm not gonna be long, I'm just gonna play Amazing Grace, my little rendition. Don't expect anything fancy. <laughs> Let me check my levels first here.
Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, Mark was saying, man, just wait. <laughs> he plays really good. And he does. You know what? All righty. Start making our way back to our seats. That'd be great. As I always say, it's good to be in the house of God with his people. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. My sermon title for this morning is Leaving a Family Legacy. Leaving a Family Legacy. Why is it that so many of our young people grow up and leave the church? It's a great question, isn't it? A recent study estimated that anywhere between 60 and 70% of our young people will end up walking away from the church when they reach their adult years. An older 10-year study suggested a rate that's slightly lower, which was 40 to 50%, which that's still terrible. Now, if you're not familiar with the way churches work, please don't think that's unique just to Adventism. It happens across all faiths. But what can we do about it? Why is it happening to us? I've got to tell you, as a parent, it scares me a lot, an awful lot. Over the years, I've noticed that even in pastoral homes, on more than, one, more than one person, I've noticed this, or more than one home, I should say, I've noticed this happening, that one or more of the children will leave the church and go out into the world and make their life without God. I also know of pastors who have experienced the heartbreak of seeing all their children leave the church even while they're still actively serving in ministry. How does this happen? What are we doing wrong, and how can we stop it? You know, when I look at our church, this church, I'm so thankful for all the programs that we have here to offer. Ground Zero, Advent Rave, Pathfinders, a vibrant family ministries department, various social activities, and even starting today, I wasn't going to announce it during the announcement period, but I'm going to say it. I did just very briefly. Today, we're going to begin training our young people for service. You know, repetition's a good thing. About the time I've said it the third time, you've heard it the first time. So you're going to keep hearing that again and again. It's all making a real difference. It's making a difference. But you know what? We need to do more. We need to do still more. Even with all that we have to offer here in this church, there's some of our young people that aren't with us anymore. In some churches, almost all of the adult children have walked away. Leaves the church wondering if they're going to be able to survive. The churches are empty and dying in some cases. It goes without saying, but without our children, the church is done. Today we're going to go to God's Word and see if we can find some answers to this very big problem. Let me just say, I can promise you that God hates this problem much more than you and I do. And He desperately wants it to stop. You see, our children are really His children. They belong to Him. So let's bow our heads and say a word of prayer and we'll dive in. Lord Jesus, this morning, once again, we've talked to you numerous times now. But one more time, I just want to pause briefly and pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon us. Lord, let this, let this information, Father, just touch us to the core. We want to be changed. We want to see this changed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to put the verses on the screen, or you can follow along in your Bible. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bacham, and he said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into a land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. 
You shall tear down their what, church? Their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and did what? They wept. They cried. So they named the place Bacham. And there they sacrificed to the Lord. When Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did what, church? Who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. You know, to fully appreciate this passage, we have to remember what's happened up to this point. God had done a multitude of miracles for his people. He had parted the Red Sea. And allowed his people to walk through on dry ground. He had caused a pillar of fire to come between his people and the Egyptians. He had made water spring out of a rock so his people could have something to drink where there was no water. He fed his people with this strange, mysterious bread in the middle of the desert where there's no food called manna. He shielded his people with a cloud from the hot desert sun. And he kept them warm on those cold desert nights. By turning that cloud into a pillar of fire. He caused a flock of quail to literally fall out of the sky when his people demanded to have meat. He caused bitter water to become sweet so his people could drink to the fill. He spoke in the hearing of his people on Mount Sinai. They actually heard God speak. Scared them half to death, but they heard it. Caused the mountain to tremble. He caused trumpets to blow seemingly from nowhere. Part of the Jordan River. While it was in flood stage. He delivered huge walled cities into the hands of his people. And gave them victory after victory on the battlefield. And after all this God made it clear that his people when they went into the promised land. Were to cut off the inhabitants of the land. They were to destroy their idols and their gods. And make a new start. A new start that would be free from the abominations which were there before. Well, it's true. The Israelites had taken some of the cities. Cities like Jericho and Ai. Sure enough, they took those cities. But there were several parts of the land, you see, that they were afraid of. And those parts, they thought the people were too big. They're giants. We can't do anything with those people. In other parts of the land, the people had iron chariots. There's no way we can go up against an iron chariot. Still other parts of the land, the people were just too many and too powerful. Even though they had seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. You see, their lack of faith and disobedience meant that idol-worshiping people and idols were left in the land that would be a temptation to them and to their children. If you can see that, please say amen. So here God comes to call his people to account. Now please notice in these verses, you do not find, thus says the Lord, from a prophet. The Bible says angel of the Lord, but it seems that this was God himself who came. He says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I will not break my covenant with you. angel of the Lord in this case was almost surely the second person of the Godhead or the pre-incarnate Christ he came to inform his people about the dire consequences that were going to follow their disobedience which caused them as the Bible says to weep these were consequences that weren't determined by God but consequences that were created 
by the people themselves because of their disobedience. Sadly, those consequences would fall not on the parents primarily, but on their children. On their children. Again in verse 10, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord. You see, the parents of Joshua's generation left a legacy for their children, but it was a legacy of disobedience and compromise. And it had terrible results. You go home this afternoon, spend the rest of the day or the afternoon reading through the book of Joshua. It's a book of heartache. I'm sorry, Judges, excuse me. It's a book of heartache. The people did evil in the sight of the Lord. The the Lord raises up a judge to deliver them, and as soon as they can, they go right back to their idols. Over and over and over. Yes, the parents may have served the Lord, but the children loved and served idols shame on those parents right hey wait a minute if 60 to 70 percent of our young people are leaving the church maybe we need to stop and ask ourselves what kind of legacy we are leaving and what will be the result the end result of that legacy could it be that we're making the same mistakes Similar to what the parents and judges too had made? As parents, we can start to turn this around by making sure that we ourselves, listen to me church, that we ourselves know the Lord. You see, we cannot give our families what we do not have. We cannot, we can teach our children about the Lord. We can teach our children what is right and wrong. We can even teach our children about the church and their responsibility. We can talk the talk, but if we're not walking the walk, we're in danger of seeing our children do the same thing that the children did in Judges 2. I saw a video on Facebook this week that really drove home that point for me. It's a video that shows different scenes and scenarios of parents setting bad examples before their children. Some of you may have seen it. I think I posted it on my wall, I'm not sure. Don't go looking at it right now, please. I know everybody and their brother's got a smartphone. (laughs) This afternoon, this afternoon. In one scene, a parent is smoking. Child's doing the same. In another scene, a parent is having an outburst of anger. The child is doing the same. A parent in another scene is throwing up from drugs and alcohol. The child is doing the same. A father is beating his wife. The child is doing the same. You see, the reality is that the life that I lead before my family determines the legacy I leave before my family. You hear me? The life that I leave, lead before my family determines the legacy I leave for my family. That legacy will not only affect my children, but their children and their children, and their children, and so on. If I'm a spirit-filled follower of Christ who's leaving a good legacy, the chances increase exponentially that they will follow. If I study my Bible regularly, and I pray fervently, chances are my children might just follow. If I live a godly life, the chances greatly increase that my children We'll do the same. Well, the parents and judges too, you see, they left the wrong legacy. They left the wrong legacy and disaster followed. Please look with me at verse 11. Then the sons of Israel, these are the children, did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Baal was a false god that had a cult-like following in Bible times. But they also worshipped, if you read a little further in the chapter, they also worshipped a female goddess named Asheroth. Baal was associated primarily with suns and storms. Asheroth 
with fertility. The parents of Joshua's generation may have served the Lord, but their children chose new gods and worshiped them. You see, the children were simply reaping the consequences of their parents' legacy. The parents may have served God, but they didn't fully obey God. Had the parents wiped out the pagan people and idols from the land like the Lord commanded, the book of Judges would read much differently. Instead of the people did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord was angry and punished them, it would read something like the people loved and obeyed the Lord with all their hearts and he blessed everything they put their hand to. And there was joy and peace in the land and their influence continued to spread from one nation to another. Wow. That could have happened. But is there a correlation here for us? Is there a correlation here for us as parents in 2014? It's true. We can't go out and eliminate all the ungodly people and kids that our children are going to come in contact with. We can't clean up the TV programs that air every day. We can't clean up the sexually suggestive songs or the songs that that glamorize drinking and drugging. We can't change the video games that so many of the young people want. No, the world is full of that stuff. It's full of that stuff, and it's only getting worse with every passing year. We also cannot put our kids in a monastery in a deserted place somewhere and keep them from all that stuff. Some parents try to do that and the results are usually disastrous. You see, they go to extremes with their children and their children go wild when they reach the age when they can make their choices, their own choices. I remember going to school with a girl I won't say her name. I don't think anybody here knows her, but going to school with a girl, her parents were super conservative and super strict. She was forced to wear long skirts and long dresses to school. She, she had a strict vegan diet, I know, because we made fun of her. She was forbidden to listen to anything but the most conservative religious music No TV, no secular radio, etc., etc. When that girl reached her mid teens, she began to go completely off the hook. She began to party all the time. She didn't believe in the church. Never looked back. You see, her parents had the best of intentions. They had the best of intentions, but all the rules and the restrictions left the wrong kind of legacy. You see, when I think about church, if I think it's just a bunch of rules and restrictions, well, that's a drag. Who wants that? So what are we to do? Go to the other extreme and throw up our hands and let our children watch, play, listen to, read, whatever they want? That's the case. I might as well do it with them, right? God forbid. Doing that will also greatly increase the chances that my children end up like the Israelite children that we're reading about in Judges 2. Judges 2, they begin worshiping idols. Chances are our children can end up worshiping idols. And I'm not talking about the religious type idols. There's plenty of other idols out there. Is there anything we can do? Well, first and foremost, we need to ensure that the legacy we're leaving for our families is one that draws them to to God and his church and doesn't repel them. We need to ensure that our children are seeing in us we want seeing in us what we want to see in them. We need to make sure that we're teaching our kids by our example and influence that church 
is vitally important. Vitally important. This means putting a priority on being at church, being active in church, getting involved. To do any less is to inadvertently teach my children that attendance and service is optional. But most importantly, our church needs to be taught both in the home and in the church, our children, rather. They need to be taught how to know Christ, how to really know Jesus and to walk with him, not just know about him. To only teach my children about Jesus in the church without teaching them to know him is to really just teach them religion. But religion without knowing Christ is dry and it's empty and it often can become a substitute for a true walk with Christ that will lead only to the lake of fire. Religion without an intimate relationship with Christ is not going to keep our children in the church. Amen? Religion without an intimate relationship with Christ is not going to get my children or my family to heaven. You see, the truth is this. Our children will end up doing what they see us doing long before they do simply what we tell them to do. Did you hear that? Let me say it one more time. Our children will end up doing what they see us doing long before they'll do what we simply tell them to do. Children need to see that Christ is vitally important. That means that he's more important than my wife or husband. He's more important than even the children themselves. That he's paramount. The life that I lead will always determine the legacy I leave for my family. I need to make sure that I'm not watching things, listening to things, entertaining myself with things that will send mixed messages to my family. Otherwise, I'm going to do the same thing that the parents did in Judges 2. Of course I'm going to set parameters around what my kids watch, read, play, and listen to. Yes, I'm going to do that. But I'm not going to go radical with it. Or at some point, they're liable to push back and turn and go the other way. They're liable to abandon God and the church in frustration. I'm not going to sit down with my children and watch things on TV that I should not be watching. I'm not going to listen to songs with my children that I shouldn't be listening to. I'm not going to play any games with them that I should not be playing. Because if I do, I'm leaving the wrong legacy. You see, every one of us needs to ask ourselves what kind of legacy it is we're leaving for our family and our children. We always want to focus on the good. We all want to, always want to focus on what our kids can do, not what's off limits. Focus on the good, educate them about the bad, and exemplify what we want to see in them. Legacy. It's all about legacy. I want us to look at one more verse here. We all know it well. We quote it all the time. But we need to look at it. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. This version says even when he's old. Some version says and when he's old. And he will not depart from it. You see, just like the Israelites in Judges chapter 2, we can train our children for good or we can train our children for evil. Are you with me? Remember years ago going to a workers' meeting and hearing a conference official stand up and tell us, telling all the pastors, pastors, please don't go home and talk about the frustrations you're experiencing in your church before your family. Don't do that. You know why he said it? Because he had done that for years and now his children didn't want anything to do with the church. Nothing. 
But please don't think that counsel is just for pastors and their families. I remember a family from years ago who were not, never happy with the church. Never happy with the church. They seemed to love God, but they sure didn't like the church. Most times they didn't like the pastors that we had. They didn't like the music when it was upbeat. They hated it when people did this. They didn't like the worship committee. They didn't like some of the Sabbath school classes. They even didn't like some of the socials that the church put on because they thought they were inappropriate. And I can promise you that it was no secret because he told it to everybody who would listen. But you know, those same people could not understand why their son, when he reached the age of accountability, left the church. They would say, I don't understand what happened. I'll call their son Jason. I don't understand what happened to Jason. He won't come to church anymore. Continue to ask people, will you pray for Jason? Will you call Jason and invite him to come to church? But Jason, you see, didn't want anything to do with the church. Over time, they began blaming the church. Well, if the music was right, if people weren't clapping in the church, I know he would come to church. If those Sabbath school classes were straightened out, I know Jason would be here. It's got to be those church socials. No, those church socials are just off the hook. And Jason gets so upset, he completely abandoned the church. Those parents are fooling themselves. See, the problem was not the church. Listen to me, parents. The problem was not the church. That would be like the Israelite parents blaming God and the people of the land for corrupting their children. You see, Jason had heard almost continually how bad the church was while he was growing up. And he didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, think about it. If a place makes the two people that he loves more than anybody else in the world that unhappy to where they're always griping and complaining about the church, why in the world would he want to hang around for the misery? To this day, it wants nothing to do with the church. You see, we cannot talk bad about the church or the people in the church, and think that any good is going to come out of that. What's that going to change? It's not going to change anything. It hurts us, and it hurts our children. If we do that, we're leaving the wrong kind of legacy. We're setting it up for our children to leave the church. Even if our kids stay in the church after hearing their parents do that, what do you think they're going to do when they get older? Their radar is going to be up for problems in the church, and they're going to be harping on the problems, talking about the problems. This church has got issues. No, we need to make it completely clear to our kids that the church is a great place to be. If you don't like your church, then find a church where you can do that. Or help reform the church you're in. If we want to increase the chances that our children are going to stay. We need them to see that we love God with all our heart. That we love his church with all our heart. And that we love the people in the church with all our heart. If we want to turn this around. We have to begin emphasizing the good. Try to avoid the bad and help fix the problems. Why? Because the life that I lead determines the legacy that I leave. The book Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students says this. Upon all parents there rests the obligation of giving physical, mental, and spiritual instruction. It should be the object of how many parents? Every parent to secure to his child a well-balanced, symmetrical character. This is the work of no small magnitude and importance, a work requiring earnest thought and prayer, no less than patient, persevering effort. 
a right foundation must be laid, a framework strong and firm erected, and then day by day the work of building, polishing, perfecting must go forward. Children may be trained, listen church, children may be trained for the service of sin or for the service of righteousness. Solomon says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. This language is positive. The training that Solomon enjoins is to direct, educate, and develop. But in order for parents to do this work, they must themselves understand the way the child should go. It is impossible, please don't miss this, it is impossible for parents to give their children proper training unless they first give themselves to God, learning of the great teacher lessons of obedience to his will. Amen. Can somebody please say amen? amen? Sadly, the Israelites inadvertently tra trained their children for the service of sin rather than the service of righteousness. You see, the legacy I leave before my family is paramount to their relation with God and his church. The legacy I leave will prove to my family to either be a blessing or a curse. The good news is, the best way to do something about my legacy, the legacy I'm leaving for my children, is not to go put on an act or a show before them, but to give myself completely to God. Completely. My kids and those around me need to see that, he's, that I'm obeying his will. That I'm following God to the very best of my ability. The more time that I spend in his word, the more time I spend in prayer, the more I surrender to him, the greater the chances that I'm leaving a godly legacy. A legacy that will lead them, that will lead me ever closer to God as my closest friend and Savior. The stakes can't be higher here, church. They cannot be higher. Because the legacy I leave with my children will, will influence them in a powerful way to either prepare for Christ's coming or to turn and run the other way. Maybe there's somebody here today thinking, Mike, I, I realize that maybe I haven't left the best legacy for my children. And now they're grown and they've left the church. Is all hope lost? As long as God's in the picture, all hope can never be lost. Amen. Begin leaving the right kind of legacy for them to follow right now. Right now. Set them down. Have a serious discussion. Apologize. Tell them you've turned it around. Let them know that you love God, you love his church, and you love the people in the church. Most importantly, pray for them like you've never prayed before. Maybe there's others thinking, Mike, I did all the things that you're talking about here, and my children still left the church. Get on your knees. Claim God's promise here in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Offer your children unconditional love and be patient with them. And allow the Holy Spirit to work on them. Maybe there's other thing, and Mike, this is great, but you know, I don't have any kids. I don't have any children just yet. You know what? You're leaving a legacy too. You're leaving a legacy for your family. You're leaving a legacy for your husband or wife. You're leaving a legacy for your friends. As they say, you are who you hang around with. I wonder today, as we close, what would happen if we all began leaving the right kind of Holy Spirit-inspired legacy for our children, for our families, for our friends? What would happen if our children consistently saw a spirit-filled example in my life and in your life? What would happen if our children, whether small or grown, only heard us speak good and positive about God, the church, and its people, rather than bad and critical? 
I want to challenge every one of us. Over the next week, I want to challenge you and me to sit down and spend at least 30 minutes, maybe an hour, considering the legacy you're leaving. Prayerfully, get on your knees, talk to God, get out his word and read. If changes are needed, go to God. Find a brother or sister in the church. Ask them to pray with you and for you. Somebody that will hold you accountable. This is a vitally important work that every one of us need to be involved in. Because in some way or another, we're all leaving a legacy. What can we do to change the fact that between 60 and 70% of our young people are leaving the church? We can leave the right kind of legacy. We can teach them to really know Christ. Not just the church, but to really know Jesus as their closest friend and personal Savior. We can begin leaving a godly legacy that will make them want to be here and not leave. You see, there are a lot of influences out there in the world. We know that. Those influences want to pull them right out the front door. But it's your, your influence and my influence that can keep them here. Finally, please remember that the life I lead will determine the legacy I leave with my family, whether good or bad. Amen.
know that I can stand. Amen. One of the best ways to do that is to get them involved. The training this afternoon is so, so important. We can get them out actively spreading God's message, far less likely to leave the church. What's the stats for Pathfinders, Lance? 83% of kids that attend Pathfinders, 83% of those hang around in the church. It makes a difference. Utilize the programs. Think about the school over here. It all makes a difference. We're looking for a total package to keep them in the faith, to keep them here at the church. They are the church. We have no church without our young people. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you for our children, our youth. We thank you for their gifts and talents, and we want to use those to the fullest. We don't want to lose any. Think about those that have slipped away. Lord, help us to reach out and bring them back, to tell them we love them, we care about them. Lord, as parents, we need your help. We need your help in in setting the right kind of legacy. There's so many pressures on us. It's hard sometimes. Lord Jesus, may we remember the best way to set a good legacy is by drawing near to you. You're there for us. You're ready to have complete communion with us. Help us to reciprocate that.
to spend time with you every day, to always do everything within our power to obey your will. I wonder today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, there's someone here today who's not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You'd like to raise your hand and say, today's my day. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Is there anyone like that here today? I wonder if there's anyone here who realizes that maybe the legacy that you've been leaving or you've already left is not what it should be. You want to raise your hand up to Jesus. Every head bowed is every eyes closed. And you want to say, Lord, help me. I want to leave the right kind of legacy for my children. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We put ourselves in your hands, Lord. The only way it's, we're going to change is if you help us to change. We thank you. We love you. We're your people. Amen.